But breakthrough means this, that somewhere along the line there's been oppression. And oftentimes when I t talk about oppression, I go to the book of Ecclesiastes and I talk about what Solomon said about oppression. And he, he stood there, he said, and seen the oppression of all those that were oppressed. And he said, there were no comforter. There was no comforter. And he's seen the tears of those people, but they had no comforter. The, the truth of the matter is, with a lot of people, uh, they walk through life in oppression, and they don't understand that that's not the case for you. It doesn't have to be the case, because there is a comforter. Somebody tell me what his name is. His name is Jesus. Yes, Jesus said, I won't leave you comfortless. He said, I will come to you. He's a paraclete, a go-between. He's a mediator. The work of the Holy Spirit's the same. It's a mediator. And so when, when you are under oppression, there is a remedy for you. In Solomon's time, the only remedy there was was what was given through the law. And it was, it was only able to roll back things for a season of time. And people in, in the Old Testament did receive miracles. It was few and far between. But in the New Testament, because of the finished work of the cross, it's a whole different story. There were many miracles, starting with John the Baptist and Jesus and on through the disciples. We see many, many miracles performed. And so what happened? What do you think? Look around. Just look at somebody and say, what happened? Where did the miracles go? Okay, I want you to think about something. Della, I see you back here. It's good to see you. God bless you. What, what happened? What happened? The, the, the New Testament church and the church of today you know, with the exceptions of maybe people like Benny Hinn or in the healing revivals that we've seen in, uh, in the last century, and with few other exceptions, we, we don't see people spending the time necessary to get to the point to where God has any time to, to bring about miracles and revival and, and turning lives around. We, we go through a process a religious process. We might as well be burning candles and holding prayer beads in our hand and doing this. And you say, well, that's, that's really terrible of you to say, Pastor Tyner. I'm talking about ritualistic religion. And, and I, that may seem like I'm picking on Catholicism, but, but the Protestant faith and people like us, even in the Pentecostal-type movements, we have our own routine. And God is having to push his way in <laughs> to have any time with us because we have an agenda and we have to get through and we have to get people out the door by a certain, certain time. Hello. We don't have night service anymore that we used to call evangelistic service. We don't have time for it. We got rid of some of those things. We've become different. And I think that's a shame. Somewhere along the line, we've kind of missed some things. Dave, I didn't see you out there. I just looked and seen Brenda just a minute ago. It's good to see you guys. It is amazing how that we have justified all this. I, want, I, I know I'm taking some time, but I want you to hear me. That's got to change. It's got to change. A, a church devoid of power is not going to exhibit any fruit. And without fruit, we're good for nothing. They might as well pull the branch off and burn it in the fire. But there is life in the vine. I mean, the true vine. Right. And you can you are connected to the true vine and that is Christ. And whenever you're connected to Christ, there is life. Turn to somebody, say you got to live. The church needs to live. We need to be vibrant. We need to be on fire. We need to be enthusiastic. We need to be showing some fruit and we need to be happy about it. 
Last night we were happy about it. And so today we need to be happy about it because today's breakthrough. And so it's going to be just a little different today. Even the prayer line is going to be just a little different. But, but we're going to give you a chance, an opportunity here in just a little bit to come up for prayer. And we're going to be naming off some things and, and asking you to respond. And if you're obedient to the Lord and you respond, I believe you're going to get what you come for. I believe that with all my heart. I believe that, that it's the response and the obedience to what God has said that brings the breakthrough. So I want you to be turning in your Bible to an age-old story in Mark chapter 10. Verse 46 is where we're going to start. And we're going to be talking about a breakthrough anointing. A breakthrough anointing. Say it with me. A breakthrough anointing. Now, obviously, there's different types of oppression. How many recognize that? There's all kinds of different types of oppression. There's physical oppression. People get physically oppressed. Not only is there normal illnesses that come from viruses, but according to what we read in the Scripture, there are, there are demonic powers that mimic different physical problems because oftentimes when Jesus addressed some type of disorder, he rebuked a spirit. How many recognize that is the truth? It is the truth. It is the truth. Not every one that he addressed did he rebuke a spirit from. So obviously that means there's other type of afflictions that people have that are physical, that are actual viruses or bacterial disorders or some type of malady that comes from a birth defect or whatever the case. Maybe you're, you are a smoker. Hello. And because of your addiction, you're, you're having problems with your lungs or your heart. Maybe it's affected you in other ways. Maybe you're an overeater. Look at me and smile. People will never know I'm talking about you, right? You're a sugar fanatic. You like chocolate and cake and strawberry pie. And it's hard to stop yourself. So you got issues. Is it all right to be honest? Look at me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you today. So, so it causes disorders. There's physical disorders. There's mental oppression. Mental. Say it with me. Mental. And if you've never had a mental oppression, then you don't understand. You're looking at a man who suffered for years with an oppressive spirit. You know, uh, when, when you have to go back and touch on a door and push on it until it bruises the tip of your finger, you, you don't have any idea what that's like, some of you. The torment of that. Going back and, and checking on things time and time and time and time and time again until my wife thought it was going to make her crazy. And finally, she come up with an idea. She said, I'm going to go with you to the door, and we're going to close it together, and we're going to make sure from that that you understand that door's closed. Now, you say, Pastor Tyner, you're a minister. You're a pastor. I, I know. It was years ago. I had to get deliverance from that because that was an obsession. There's an obsessive, compulsive behavior. Some of you... And the building has had that. Some of it, there's people that wash their hands constantly. I don't know. That may be you. But that's oppression. It can be a depression or anxiety. Now, I'm going to take my time because I, I, I want to get through to some of you. Some of you are overly anxious. I, I prayed for a young man last night. I believe he, he suffered from a, a disorder. And it was a nervous disorder. 
and I, I, I was able to share a few things with him, but I, I, you know, you want to pull people off the side and spend some time with them, but people need to be aware that even disorders like that, nervous tics, different things that some of us suffer from, they can be oppressive, and they can keep us from achieving in life. The devil keeps you down. Look at me. Here's where the devil's got some of you. Under his foot. And you don't have freedom. And you can't achieve what you could have. And it makes you afraid to stand up amongst people. Some of you have speech disorders. Oh, is it all right if I am honest with you? And you say, well, well, God can't heal that. Look at me. That's a lie from the pit of hell. God can heal that. Some of you have been healed from stuttering. God healed you from that. I know of people that's been healed from that. God healed them. Took away that disorder. There are spiritual oppressions. Demonic attacks. Where spirits control people. And occasionally... People are possessed by a spirit. Now that's, in, in this area, it happens. It's more rare, it seems like, than it used to be. You used to, where you would see more possessions uh, of that. Today, I believe they exist. But if they get out into uh, the medical field, it's misdiagnosed and people are put into uh, restraints that are not, Physical restraints, but it's drug-induced restraints. So it becomes masked by that. Hello. But nonetheless, it's oppression. Can God deliver us? Does God want to heal us? Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's no reason why you have to remain oppressed when there's a remedy for that. There is a bomb in Gilead. There is, there's a remedy for disease and sickness and oppression. And so when that is given and that resource is available, we've, we don't need to convince ourselves that it's God's will for us to be that way because that's exactly what the devil wants you to believe, that God has willed it to be that way. When you have a resource, look to the cross right now. You see that center cross right there? That cross was for your redemption, for your healing. And by His stripes, the Bible says you are healed. That was a resource. The Bible said look and live. And Jesus said if I be lifted up, come on, there's a remedy. Just like the serpent was raised up amongst the people when there were fiery serpents that were afflicting the people. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men. And there's a resource. And that resource is available for you. This little story talks about a man who was suffering from a physical illness. What was it? Look at the story and tell me what it was. Some of you see a heading on your Bible that says this man's name. Blind Bartimaeus. How many of you have heard of this story before? Most of you have. Raise your hand. So you're going to have to fight through your instinct to say, I already know this story, Pastor. There's some things in this story that you need to hear. And even though it's an age-old story, there's more that the Holy Spirit wants to say. And there's some people in this room that need to pay attention to this. Because I'm going to share several aspects right now. Seven truths that will help you to break three, free. And, it came, and they came to Jericho as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people. Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. He wasn't a uh, wealthy fella. 
in his time, he was begging, and you didn't make a lot of money begging. They didn't have welfare and Social Security and benefits for those that folks like that. So people begged, and they depended upon the generosity of others to make it. Think about this. If it were... In the, if we were in the same situation today, how many people have you helped in the last while? Oh, hum a little bit. It might help you. We make all kinds of excuses why we don't help people. But you, you, you need to be benevolent to people. There are people around you that need help. And it doesn't hurt every once in a while when the prompting of the Holy Spirit says, help them out to give them a little something. Can I hear an amen? amen? Buy them a sandwich. If you, you think they're going to misuse the money and buy drugs with it, buy them a sandwich. And if they don't want to have a sandwich, let them alone. Because <laughs> what they want is another fix, and you don't need to be doing that. If somebody can't pay a bill, and you know it's legitimate. Help them out. I don't know why I said all that. The Lord knows. But anyway, here's blind Bartimaeus. And he's sitting by the wayside begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried the more, a great deal, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying to him, be of good comfort, rise, he calleth for thee. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou have me that I should do unto thee? And the blind man said to him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way. Thy faith has made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. What a beautiful story. So I'm going to talk about seven truths. And if you have a pad of paper or you have your electronic device, put it on notes real quick and type some things out. Write some things down. You'll need these seven truths. The first one I'm going to talk about today is positioning. So you have part of it down already. You've done the right thing. Where are you at? Look at somebody and say, where are you at? So answer them. Where are you at? I'm at church. What is there about church? Wherever two or three are gathered together in his name, what did he say? So is Jesus here? So you got one thing right already. Now, it doesn't mean by virtue of the fact you're just sitting here that you're going to get a miracle. Because you, you've got to understand that positioning is more than just being in a physical place. There's a spiritual place you need to get to. Oh, that you let that one pass right over the top of your head. There's a spiritual place you need to get to. So some people in the room are here and some people in the room aren't here. Look at your neighbor and say, are you here? So positioning is very very important, and I believe more important than what some people think. Positioning along with timing and positioning is, is simply associated with being in the place of grace for God. And the Lord shows up, and we're, uh, we're there to seek Him, and He's going to be found of us because of the fact that God makes these things happen. God is in the business of divine appointments. God is in the business of bringing things together, and He's been that way in your life, all of your life. And when you can recognize that and take advantage of positioning, even if you have to move yourself like the woman that had the issue of blood and make your way to Him, there's going to be more happen because you're in the right position than you ever thought possible. Praise God. So you have to be aware of where you're at. You have to be aware physically, mentally, spiritually 
of the presence of the Lord. Because in His presence, what is there? Fullness of joy. There's opportunity that happens when you come into an agreement with the Lord where you're in proximity where He is. Praise God. There's something happens to you when you're in the presence of God. Just think about when Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up, his train filled the temple, and there he is in the presence of God. Something happened, and it changed his life. Just by being in close proximity to where Jesus was. When Jesus come over to Mary and Martha's house, think of this. Same house, two sisters. One understood positioning and the other didn't. Can I hear an amen? One was busy trying to fix a supper to entertain the Lord. And they thought, she thought, her name was Martha. Martha thought just by the fact that she was serving the Lord at that moment, and sometimes we we have the same problem. We, we miss what God's doing in the church because church becomes work. That's why some of you have a hard time getting up and getting to church because it equates to work. And if you ever get that way, you need to break that spirit and find a place with God to where you can enjoy yourself. And if you're in some kind of ministry and you're missing it, you need to say, wait a minute. Oh, I'm just as serious as I can be. There's a reason why Sister Tyner's sitting out here in the crowd today. Let me take advantage of this. Because for years of her life, she sat in an office counting your money, making sure it went to the right places with an accountability partner. And she was in there in that office every week. And she finally had enough about her to say, I'm done with that. Because I'm, I'm Martha, I'm Martha, and I'm missing positioning. I'm missing that place with God. And so she says to me, she said, I want to, I'm going to do something else. She said, I've got to. And I said, well, do it. And so who was the other sister? Somebody tell me. It was Martha and Mary. And Mary, where was she at when Jesus come over? She was sitting somewhere at his feet. So blind Bartimaeus, in this case, he was already at the right place. And sometimes it's just this divine encounter. Sometimes you have to position yourself. Today, I would suppose this. You're already here. You're in a physical place. I want you to position yourself in a spiritual place. So if you're sitting there with a partner and you're you're trying to woo them or whatever, I want you to quit that and start paying attention to the one that you need to be paying attention to today. I remember going to church and holding hands with some of the young ladies I grew up with. I didn't meet Trish until I was a ripe old age of 16. But I'd been sitting with girls since I was in kindergarten. I was an early starter. I still remember those little hands holding my hand and writing me notes, check yes or no. <laughs> Absolutely. I couldn't have told you what the preacher said at all. Didn't, didn't know. But we miss our moment. So timing is important. Say it with me, timing. That's the second one. Uh, you have to be ready to receive. When you see an opportunity, you need to take advantage of it. The Lord said, in an acceptable time, I heard you. In the day of salvation, I've helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. And behold, now is the day of salvation. What happened with blind Bartimaeus? Did he miss his moment? No. He was in the right position, and here's the timing. Maybe he'd been thinking about his situation for a while. Maybe it's kind of hit him hard at this point. You know how it is with oppression. Sometimes you get hit harder than others, and you think about it more. It becomes really real to you. 
whether it's depression and you've been crying a lot lately, you know, you miss life. I'm talking to somebody right here. I don't know. I just feel the Holy Spirit say you're talking to somebody. You miss life. You used to know what it was to really live. And now you're missing it. And you're getting hit hard with that. You feel like your life's been taken away. Maybe that was where blind Bartimaeus was. You know, it's not been so easy lately. I'm having a hard time getting anybody to help me to do anything. Sound familiar? I'm kind of left alone, feeling alone. Feeling like nobody cares. And so timing meant something to him. He knew that this was a moment that he didn't want to pass by. He wanted to take advantage of it. And we see that in the way that he reacted with God. Let me ask you this. Do you think this might be your time? What do you think? If the Lord's passing by and you found out about this church service and you thought, I'm going to get there. I'm going to get to that service. I'm going to get in that line. I'm going to, I'm going to get set free. Friend, the Lord is here to meet your need. God brought you here. This is your time. Turn to somebody and say, it's your time. So the next thing is, number three, you've got a desire change. I'm going to say it like this, and if you want to put down your notes this way, it's this. you got to want to. Say it with me. you got to want to. There's some people that don't care. You become adjusted. Life, life is not that important anymore. Maybe you've gotten hardened to your condition. And, and let me tell you something. I can't break that off of you. You've got to do it yourself. Not even God can help you. When you are in a place of stiffness and hardness and you refuse to let the Lord soften you. God does not make you a robot. God gives you opportunity. It's up to you to respond to that. So you got to want to. You have to desire change. I want to be different. I want things to change. The Bible says you must lay aside every weight and sin that so easily besets you. That takes some effort. It takes effort to want to change. I want things to be different. It's lunacy to think that things can go on the way they are and you're going to get the change you desire. You must Start and initiate some things that's going to bring about those changes. You got to want to. The episode in the scripture that really sticks out in my mind is in John chapter 5, where Jesus comes to the pool of Bethesda. And there's a man there that's been in a condition for 38 years. Brother Ron, you talked about that guy, 38 years. After a while, life just kind of goes on, and it, it, it's one thing. It's like driving. How many of you get on these trips, and you're going a long way? How many has been out past, let's say, Amy's going to Iowa. Let's say, how many of you has been past Illinois or Kentucky or Ohio? And you get to the point in a trip, now think of it with me, where where. At first, every mile is, is painful, right? But then you get in a zone, right? You get in a zone. And so when you get in a zone, the miles just go, whoosh. well, I want 700 miles today. Has come. Because I, you know, I've trained my wife now to where. She holds herself and not has to go to the bathroom every two hours. And when the, when the Maltese dogs go to sleep, 
Pastor Tyner puts the pedal to the metal, and we make the miles melt. <laughs> Especially when Sister Tyner is snoozing. I can tell. I listen to that breathing pattern. It changes, and she starts going. <sighs> <sighs> I say, thank you, Jesus. We're going to make some miles today. Get in the flow, man. Life just happens. And after a while, you've been in a condition for a long time, and you're just life is just passing by. But some point or another, you're going to wake up and say, stop the train. Hang on. I'm not getting any younger. Oh, that hurts, doesn't it? Because a lot of our, our youth is taken away. And our life's taken away when we're under oppression. And it can be years of life. So when Jesus comes to this man at the pool of Bethesda, he says to him, he knows he's been in that place for a long time. He starts talking to him about life. And he says, he says will you, do you want to be well? Some of you have heard me preach this before. Do you want to be well? Do you see that you have a need to get well, to get delivered? And this guy had such an issue that he starts talking to him about his problem. You ever talk to somebody like that? And the first thing out of their mouth, they're going to tell you all about their problem. And he says, well, look, he said, you know, I'm here and people aren't treating me right. And when I want to get down the water, people butt in front of me and nobody's here to help me. Everybody go, wah, 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 wah. You know, doomed despair and agony. Deep, dark depression, excessive misery. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. And so they continue in their problems, right? And Jesus had mercy on him. Jesus finally just said, look, man, take up your bed. You got to do something, though. You got to be willing. You got to want to. You got to want to. Say it with me. You got to want to. You're sitting here today. You'll have an opportunity here in just a moment, but you got to want to. Number four, a willingness to cry out. I'm going to tell you something. There's going to be a time in your life where things are going to get bad enough. You're going to cry out. I tell people that. I, I've been through life. I've been with a lot of people over time, been their pastor, and I, I, I can tell you that there's always a time in life where, where your pride is going to go to the side and you're going to cry out. And that's going to be one of the things that's going to break oppression is when you're willing. It's the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man that availeth much. When you get to the point where you're like blind Bartimaeus and you say, Jesus, have mercy on me. And you don't care if your face gets contorted. I watched grown men in my kickstart service today. And one of them made mention. He said, I, I really don't want to cry. And here come the tears. Men are really bad about it, right? We don't want to show emotion, right, Nathan? Some of these manly men. Jeff Buck. Manly. <laughs> I'm a redneck man. I'm a manly man. I drive a diesel pickup truck. Bless God. I don't cry. I don't. Dad told, told me that boys don't cry. Big boys don't cry. And so I have learned in life that that's a crock. Because I watched those men in Kickstart begin to weep and tell about their miracle and how God changed them and how God healed them and how God set them free. And whoo, glory to God, I was rejoicing and yeah. 
<laughs> what was great was the ladies were weeping with them. You know. <laughs> the other guys were saying, <laughs> trying not to cry. If my people who are called by my name would what? Humble themselves. I don't care what I look like. I don't care where the snot flies. I don't care if my hair gets messed up. Don't care if I get blessed and dance out of my shoes. Mm. Hallelujah. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamped around about them that fear him and delivered them. The righteous cry and the Lord heareth and delivereth them out of their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and saveth such of a contrite spirit. You kind of get the gist of that? Number five, resisting opposing spirits. The devil doesn't want you to be healed. There's people that's going to stand in your way, things that are going to stand in your way. If you go to that church, if you start serving the Lord, know this, I'm not going to go with you and I'm not one of those Christians. Because, you know, this has been our life and I don't want it to change. I still want to do my thing. I still like going to the bars. I still like doing that. And I want you to be part of that. And I don't want us to have to worry about that. And if you go to one of them churches and you get quote unquote religious, I don't know how I'm going to react to that. I don't know how I'm going to react to it. So what are you going to do? You're going to stay in your oppression? You're going to let somebody lord over you? Come on now, preach. Somebody. You, that's, that's the problem. Some, and I'm, I'm going to speak to some of you ladies. You become a doormat, and you've been a doormat for so long that you don't know the difference. Is it okay if I say it? You're going to have to rise up and determine you're going to live no matter what. You're going to live, and you're going to have life, and you're going to have fun, and... Your opinion amounts to something, and if you want to serve the Lord, you'll serve the Lord, bless God. You're going to be a Christian, hallelujah. And if you want to get spirit-filled and go to one of them Pentecostal churches, bless God, I'm going to go, hallelujah. And when I'm there, I'm going to be praying for you, husband. And sometimes it's the other way around, right? And the man has to make up his mind, I'm going to go on. I'm going to serve the Lord. I've had people tell me before. You know, uh, I watched a young couple when I first started pastoring. And uh, they were big helps to me. And, and suddenly the, the young man, he had a drug problem. He fell back into it. And I, as a pastor will do, I went over to their house to check on them. And I'll never forget, I went into the house and... And the, I don't think the gentleman would even talk to me. And the, I asked the lady, I said, listen, I said, you need to come on. And my, my standard thing is to tell them, so the best opportunity your husband has to get saved and stay saved if you'll come on yourself and don't quit. And she looked at me with tears running down her face. She said, I won't be able to make it if he doesn't come with me. Is that the way you're living your life? First of all, I'm going to say it and people hate me for it, but these aren't the dark ages anymore. Come on. Ever since the Vir Virginia Slim commercials. Ever since you got voting rights, ladies, some things begin to change for you, and you need to act like you got something about yourself. Well, I don't know why I'm preaching all this, but the Lord knows. And it's okay to have an opinion, 
And it's all right to speak out, and it's all right to pray over your lunch and your dinner and teach your children how to pray. Woo! Glory to God. It's all right to read your Bible. It's all right to be part of a women's group. It's all right to serve the Lord. Praise God. Give the Lord a round of applause today. And if you can get your feelings hurt, you'll get your feelings hurt if you're not careful. And sometimes it's religious people that stand in your way. Well, it's hard when it's religious, folks. In blind Bartimaeus' case, it was some of the, the cream of the crop. Amen. Some of Jesus' own disciples said, you need to be quiet, dude. They got all religious. Go to church. and People come to church like this, and it kind of throws them a little bit. You got little girls up here waving things, and people say, oh, that's out of line. We're raising up a generation. I said, we're raising up a generation that won't have a problem when they get older praising the Lord and knowing how to worship. And we don't ship them off to children's ministry until after they've had a chance to worship the Lord and feel the presence of God. Come on, hallelujah. We don't want our children with us. What's wrong with that? Children need Jesus. And as much as we love children's class, they need to be around where the presence of the Lord is moving with the adults as well. It's those examples that will teach them throughout the rest of their life. Let's give the Lord a round of applause for that one. Amen. Hallelujah. So you can't get your feelings hurt, even when it's Christian people. You know, you went to the bathroom today, and there was a sister in there. You don't even know her name, and she gave you a sour look. Because you got to the paper towels first, and she was standing there, and, and you watched her shout in that service, and oh God, if that's how it is there. Look at how the devil uses things. All right, number six, obedience. And I'm quickly moving through the rest of the two, so just stay with me. Are you willing to be obedient? Jesus called for him. He cried out the more, and when Jesus heard it, he stopped the procession and he called for him. Tell this man to come. So here's the question. Are you going to be obedient when he calls for you? One of the greatest things in the world is when he calls your name. Tell him to come. Tell him to come. You're going to be pulled on by the Holy Spirit. I want us to start in prayer right now. I want us to be in prayer the whole time. Confession is the next one. That's the last one. So if you're taking your notes, put that on there. Confession. Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do? Why would he ask him that? He wants him to say something. He wants him to respond. There's a call, but there must be a response. I said, there's a call, but there must be a response. I'm going to say it again. There's a call, but there must be a response. All of heaven is going to be waiting on you today. God sent a message to you. God's been speaking to you the whole service.